been talking a lot about deception recently. In order for you to know if you've been deceived or are being deceived, you need to have discernment. So, you know, we look at the scriptures and it talks about so many different things at that time that's still happening today. There was a lot of noise out there, a lot of different things going on. They were afraid to even speak at their tables about certain things because they didn't know who was listening or if they were going to be turned into the Romans or to the Pharisees. They had to be very careful. Today, we hear a lot of different things depending upon which news outlet you listen to. What do you believe? Who do you believe? If you're into the politics at all, whose who's spin do you listen to? What's right? What's not? We need biblical, godly discernment to be able to cut through what is real, what is truth, what is fiction, what is God's purpose, what's his, his whole plan on this? You know, what does he think about this? You know, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, and you can turn there if you want to, it says, that's 1 John 4, 1. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. The apostle John, issues, he issues this warning. He said, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And according to the New Testament, discernment is really not an option for a believer. It's a requirement. How are you going to be able to determine if somebody is giving you the right message if you're not able to discern what's right and wrong? Okay. Then we go on and we see that in Philippians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. There's that word again. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Well, we need to be discerning again. If we can't discern, then we're going to be making some bad choices out there. Now, to define discernment, discernment is distinguish, separate, investigate, examine, scrutinize, question, judge, to grasp and comprehend an act that is obscure. Why do we need to be discerning? Because in order to be discerning, we have to be able to, to make determinations. Now, I know that people think, oh, you can't judge. But you know what? We have to, to judge. We do need to judge what is right and what is wrong. And how do we discern that? Well, the Word tells us, if you get into your Word and you find out from the Bible the things that are right, that are wrong. We learn that lying, cheating, stealing, killing, adultery, all that stuff is wrong. That's right there in black and white. Sometimes things are a little vague. Sometimes relationships can be a little, I don't know, you meet somebody for the first time and you're, you want to take them at face value, but you don't know for sure what that person's intentions are, what their motivations are. You don't really know if what they're telling you is what you want to hear or if what they mean is true. So you have to evaluate that. You listen to what they say, you smile politely, and it's like, Lord, I need to know something here. Is this on the level? Are what they're telling me true or is this not? How do we determine that? Well, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about peace. And I like this because, see, it's bigger and I can see it better. But anyway, we want to talk a little bit about peace this morning. And you know, the peace that goes along with discernment is interesting. That word peace is in the, the New Testament, I believe it's 88 times in 88 different verses. And it talks about rest. So when you're trying to make a decision and you're not sure what to do, where do you find the most rest from? Where is your peace at? So if you have to evaluate something, say that you need to make a major purchase, and you really don't know if you should do it or you don't, if you shouldn't do it, so you're kind of evaluating, cheapers, I don't know, yeah, we could do it, but is it the best move? Where's your peace? Do you really feel like do making that commitment, that financial commitment, is going to give you rest? Or is that financial you know, commitment going to give you more anxiety later on? You know, the Lord knows, he looks ahead. He knows whether you're going to keep that job. He knows where you're going to be living. He knows what your income level is going to be at. You need to go with that peace in your heart when you're making those decisions. Relationships are classic. 
I can't tell you the number of times that I have talked to somebody and they're entering into a relationship with someone who may not be saved or who is not living for the Lord. But man, that is their golden person. They love that person with all their heart. They don't care if that person is living for the Lord or not. They do, but there's all, well, I think that they'll come around and the more time I spend. And, and meanwhile, you start to see them slowly slipping away from church. Or, this is more what happens, that person comes to church with them quite regularly. And after they get, they snag their person, person no longer starts coming to church. And then the next thing you know, that person starts to slide off. And then, you know, if they've gotten married, the kids are not being raised in a Christian environment. Dad still believes or mom still believes, but nobody's going to church and it's not being talked about much in the house. The kids are learning and getting their own kind of vision from school and their peers. And, and, and it, there's, that wasn't God's original plan. But because you couldn't wait and you got involved with the wrong person, you not only messed up your life, but you messed up everybody else's too. We have to be willing to wait. And see, that's the problem we have as Christians a lot of times is we don't really want to wait. We don't really, really apply patience. And when we're making decisions, we've got to apply patience. I remember a time when my husband and I were going out looking for a car, and there was this one car that I really, really had my heart set on. And he kept, eh, I don't know, there's this, there's that. I'm like, yeah, but it has this, and it's got this, and it's got that. And he's like, eh. And I'm like, okay. So we back away, I go home, and we continue to look. <laughs> I'm telling you, God is so good. We, got, we found another car, more bells and whistles, less money, less miles, because we waited. We didn't go for what I thought was the golden goose. You know what I mean? We held back and, and we waited. Sometimes you see something and it is everything that you want, but you have this feeling inside. The kids know it like a red light, green light kind of thing. It's your discernment. If you're born again, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, your conscience can help you make decisions. You can trust your conscience. You can trust your, your, your inside knowing. You can trust your peace. And you have to be willing sometimes to let go of what you want and let the Lord work because what he's got is better than what you could have imagined. You ha we have to be more patient. We have to be more discerning. You know, I, I hear a common phrase a lot of times like, well, we can't judge anybody. We can't judge anybody. The Bible says not to judge because you'll be judged with that same measure. It's not saying sit there and judge somebody because, well, that's not a designer outfit and I have a designer bag, so I don't really want to, you know. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about who your friends are. Pick your, pick your, your friends, your relationships, your decisions. Where you go, what you do, those are the things he's talking about. You need to judge. If you want to go out and, and hang out with somebody, and this person happens to be of a, a, a poor reputation, say it's somebody who uh, likes to go out and do a lot of dancing or nightclubbing or stuff like that, and you're kind of like, well, maybe I could win them to the Lord. Stop. Go with, go, let's back up. Where's your peace? Do you really feel like that's the right place for you to be? You Are you really going to win them over, or are they pulling you in a little bit? And is it because you haven't really taken that time to pray? Is it because you really kind of want to go and do that, and you're using this as an excuse? I can remember when I was single, and I was still in the, the nightlife scene, and I can remember one time I was, I was out, and this guy came up, and he's got his cigarette, and he's got his drink. <laughs> And he starts telling me about Jesus. I'm telling you that guy's fortune he didn't wear his drink and eat his cigarette, okay? Because I was ripped. I was furious. I was not living for the Lord. I was not professing to be a Christian. But this guy was 100% a hypocrite in my opinion, and I let him know that. That guy went kind of creeping out of that place because he had no business being in there. It was not... 
he wasn't there for the right reason. He wanted to drink, he wanted to smoke, but he's going to try to cover it up, his own actions, by making it feel better. I witnessed to somebody. I didn't know anything. I was not living for the Lord. I knew nothing. But I knew that that guy was, was using this as an excuse. And, you know, we have to discern our own motives sometimes. Why are we doing something? You know, not just somebody else, but what is our real intention? Are we trying to go out of our way to be helpful because we want everybody to say, oh, you're such a good person. Aren't you so wonderful? Or are you doing it because you really feel like the Lord is leading you to do that? You know, sometimes our own intentions, our own motivations, we have to look at and we have to examine ourselves. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to be very careful with our decision-making process. Sometimes how you make a decision is as, is as important as a decision itself. If you've got an opportunity to do something, say you want to change jobs, and you make your list, and oh, yeah, look at all these things. I get these benefits, and I get this salary, and I get this many days off, and I'm taking a look on this side. It's like, yeah, but it's an extra hour away, and it's this many miles, and I got a paper parking, and yeah, but look it, look it, look it, and I have a nice corner office over here, and you know, you start to, to make evaluations, and if you don't include the Lord in your decisions, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Don't be swayed by just your pros and your cons. Pray over it. Lord, okay, these are the pros and these are the cons, but you know what the best one is, the best position. Sometimes you have to lay it out in black and white like that so that you can actually look at it and know all of a sudden you're laying it all out and you know in your spirit, you know what, this isn't it. It just isn't it. You know, you do not have a piece about it. And as soon as you decide not to do something, you have a piece. So you can have a piece Deciding not to do something is making a decision also. You just have to know where is that peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's um, the scripture that I really would like to, to look at right now. A couple of those scriptures that have to deal with our peace and being able to discern. And of course, my notes are all messed up now, so I don't have everything in order, but that's okay. The Bible talks about that peace that surpasses all understanding. And it talks about letting the peace rule in your heart. We have to be able to know. How does that happen? Again, reading the word, praying in the spirit. When we're praying in the spirit, there's nothing you say that can go wrong. You're not praying improperly. You're not throwing in a lot of stuff that's not necessary. It's your spirit to the, to, to the Lord, and there's nothing that gets in the way of that. And that's what we need to do more of, because when we're praying in the spirit, we're also building ourselves up. We're, we're getting edified. We're getting encouraged. We're starting to really see. It, we don't, I shouldn't say we see it. It's more like all of a sudden you become a little more in tune to the things of the Lord, and you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. But you need to also ask the Lord for wisdom. Ask him for discernment. He loves it when we ask for wisdom. But be willing to follow what he wants you to do. So often I hear people, I remember this one woman one time, she came in and she was about to make this life choice. And she knew it was wrong. She sat in front of me and she said, this is what I'm doing. It's, I know, she said, I know that you're not going to approve, but this is what I'm going to do. I said, it doesn't matter whether I approve or not. It's what does the Lord say? She says, oh, I know he doesn't like it, but this is what I'm going to do. And I was like, well, I appreciate the honesty, but she said, I really don't see any other way around it, and it's what I want. So this is what I'm going to do. And I was just like, well, okay, your mind's made up. There is nothing I am going to say that's going to sway you. And I just said to her, you know that he cannot bless this decision. She said, I know that, but that's okay, because this is what I want. Like, okay, then I'm just going to pray for you, you know, that, that your eyes are open. There's nothing else I can do. But, you know, don't come back and expect me to pick up the pieces either if this doesn't work out. And unfortunately, a few years later, did not work out at all. Situation just got 
much, much worse. And, you know, the person is, I really don't know where they're at right now. Um, I really don't. But they know that they're going to have to make a, a, you know, a reconciliation with the Lord because there's nothing more that, that can be done for them in the natural. Um, and it's very sad to see that people are willing to sacrifice that sometimes. They're willing to sacrifice the relation for the Lord to go after the, the brass ring here, so to speak, that, that they want the things of the flesh, they want the things of this world has, knowing that the only blessing they can get is whatever the world has to come. And hey, I gotta tell you, there's an enemy of this world, and he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He doesn't come to bless and give, okay? And if you're not going to operate the way the Lord wants you to operate, then the next thing that's going to end up happening is there's still things that are going to happen to you, and you're not going to be able to have a lot of, of say in it because you're not working with the Lord. You're not saying, Lord, I need your help on this. You're just kind of having to go along with, okay, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, you know? And, and that's not what we're called to do. We're called to be a discerning people. We're called to be able to, to say, Lord, I want your will. Your will be done in my life because his will is the right will. We've got to put ourselves down. Okay, we've got to really tap into him for our decisions. We've talked about choosing friends, and that is so very important. But, you know, sometimes we make little decisions, too. And a little decision can have a huge impact. And, and we don't think it's a big deal. Eh, doesn't matter, I'll do this. Or, eh, doesn't matter, I'll do that. We're really casual about it. Kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden when she just kind of like listened to what Satan had to say in the form of the snake and say, yeah, that fruit does look pretty good. I think I will take a bite. Changed the whole course of mankind. The human race ended up having to live in the state that we're in because one woman decided that fruit really did look pretty tasty, okay? That was a small thing with a big impact. Let's take a look at Queen Esther. Before Queen Esther, there was Queen Vesidi, Vesidi and King uh, Xerxes, okay? Xerxes ended up marrying Esther, but the reason he ended up marrying Esther was because he had a lovely, beautiful queen, Mercedes. Uh, Vesti, Vesti, I can never remember how to say it. Sorry about that. But anyway, this king had, he ruled over 127 provinces. And that covered from India to Ethiopia. The man was as wealthy as wealthy could be, okay? And, and he was like to show off his wealth. He was hosting a feast that had lasted 180 days, Okay, he had nobles and princesses from all over the area, as well as officials from Persia and Media. And after the conclusion of the 180 days, he held another feast for an additional seven days. Well, this one, anybody who was in the court's palace, at the, the palace court at that time, could stay. And while they were staying um, at this feast, the men started drinking too much. Okay. And the king definitely did, though there was probably several others that did too, because it said that they were able to have as much as they wanted to. And you can find all this in Esther chapter 1, verse 10 through 21, okay? So if you want to look up the scriptures afterwards, for time's sake, we're not going to go there. But Esther 1, verses 10 through 21, we'll get into it. So anyway, at this feast... Now, this is the last night of his 187 days of partying, all right? He decides that he wants to have everybody see how beautiful his queen is. Now, it was not customary for that time for the women, especially Persian women, to be seen in public without their coverings, all right? And he sends his seven eunuchs to go pick her up, tell her that he wants her and to wear her royal crown. Doesn't want any coverings on her, all right? And all these guys, she's supposed to go into this feast with these men that have been drinking and partying, okay? 
And she's supposed to go in and show everyone how beautiful she is. She's mortified. This is not protocol. This is not dignified. This is not what, what we do. And, and she said, no, I'm not going in. <laughs> the king was furious, furious because she refused him. I mean, this is like in this day, you did not refuse anything that your king wanted you to do, no matter who you were, especially the queen. So when she refused, I mean, that made him look like a total fool, like he had no control over his own, you know, his own palace, over his own wife. If he can't control his wife, how can he con control 127 provinces? Well, at least that's what all his counselors tried to tell him. So he said, all right, then we'll, the, his counselors advised him to make a decree that he will, she will never be allowed to see the king again and that she will be replaced as queen. So that's what happened. We don't know anything else that happened to the queen, the former queen, after that. But she was never allowed to see the king again. So he put his talent scouts out looking for somebody else, and Queen Esther ended up fitting the bill. And that's another story, and you can read on after that. But the whole point was is that with this man, he, just by saying to her, well, I should say by her saying to him, I'm not coming, changed the entire course of, the, the, of Jewish history there. Because now Queen Esther took her place and was able to save the lives of the Jews that were being plotted against to be killed. Haman wanted to kill every Jew in Persia. And when Hester, Esther got the chance to be on the throne, she was able to convince the king not to do it. She uncovered a major plot, and, and the Jews were saved. And so it's a good thing that in this case, Vasadi made this uh, bad, you know, this uh, little tiny decision that changed the whole course of history. So little things can may have big impacts. Where you go, who you hang out with. Now, Jesus, he would sit with sinners, publicans, uh, tax collectors, but he wasn't hanging out with them. He's having a meal with them. There's a difference. There's a difference between sitting with somebody who's not saved and, and having an opportunity to speak into their lives or, or to get to know them casually or get to know them as an acquaintance. And it's different from doing that to going out and spending a lot of time with them, going to the same places they're going, doing the same things they're doing because you want to win them over. We need to start listening to that inner, that inner voice inside those red lights, green lights, our peace, our rest. We need to start listening to that. Sometimes there's things that you, it makes no sense. You think that something would be quite simple. Maybe it's driving down a certain road and you just feel like, you know what? I'm gonna go a different way. You have no idea what kind of accident you may have just avoided. You know, we have to be able to decide. That's a, an example of a little decision that could have had a big impact. So we need to be able to discern, to really be pressing into the Lord when we make our decisions. So I know that we're going to have to get going for time's sake, but, you know, there's one other person I want to share with you about. And this guy, he makes me so mad. Samson. Oh, my gosh, I don't like Samson. Okay. <laughs> Samson was anointed by the Lord. He was the strongest man, and he had an ego to match. Samson thought he was all it, and he was until this is a this to me is a mind blower. The reason he makes me so mad is he got involved with this woman that he really, really enjoyed. And this woman was Delilah. And Delilah was a beautiful woman. And Samson just really, really wanted her. So Delilah set her sights on him because she wanted to find out the source of his strength. If she could find the source of his strength, then she was going to be getting a thousand pieces of whatever it was, whatever the monetary was at that time, um, from each one of these men. There was like 11 of these Philistines that were going to pay her off. So she would tell Samson, 
She would ask Samson, what's the, what's the, the source of your, uh, your, your strength? And he would tell her some made up thing. The woman would go ahead and do it, like tie him up with whatever it was. Then she would call the Philistines to come in to capture him. And he would break free, beat up the Philistines, laugh it off, and go back to her? Hello? Where are your brains, mister? Because they're not functioning up here. I, I just, this is why the man makes me so mad. Three times. He's so dumb. I'm sorry. He might have been strong and anointed by God, but this is a guy you want to slap across the face. Literally, let's shake the brains loose here because they're not happening. You know, three times he does this. And then he finally gets exasperated and tells her the truth. So hello, what do the Philistines do? They, she cuts his hair. They come, they take him away. They blinded him because they didn't know if he was really going to, you know, what he was going to do. They poked out his eyes and they sent him to be a grinder. And then they take him and decide they're going to have him perform in the temple. There's 3,000 people in the temple. They are going to mock him and make fun of him because the Lord had, had anointed him with this strength to take out the Philistine army, to really make a dent in the Philistine army. Because the Philistines were, you know, killing the Christians. Those Jews, the Jews, I should say. So anyway, Samson gets into the temple and he says, Lord, give me strength one more time. Let me take them down and I want to go too. And the Lord gives him the supernatural strength and he puts his arms up against these pillars and he shakes the entire supports of this temple and the temple comes crashing in and kills 3,000 of the Philistines that day. That was his last great act. But could you imagine the guy had said in one of the battles, he took out a 1,000 men by himself. What he could have done, he was a one-man army. God anointed him for a specific purpose, and he perverted that purpose. He, he used that purpose just to, to laugh it off to, for fame and glory. How many of our, our famous musicians are out there today that have been anointed by God with the ability to play or to sing, and instead they're flaunting it out there for riches and for glory? I feel terrible about that because they're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of God someday and say, yeah, Lord, I know that this is what you wanted me to do for you, but look at what I got. What did they get? Because when they're in that ground, there's nothing with them. You know, that part of you that is here, this is just skin covering, okay? This is just gift wrap. What's in here is you. When we die, this, this just goes in the ground, or if you're cremated or whatever it is, it's ashes. What lives on is this part of us. Our spirit goes on. We don't just get to go into a hole and that's the end of it. That's what some people want to believe. You know why? Because it's so much sweeter to think that we just evaporate. There's no evaporation, folks. I'm telling you, we, there was before we were born. You know, the Lord knew us before we were born. There's this, there's this old movie in the 1940s and Rosalind Russell, Russell had this line and she said, you know, before we were born, we were spirit. She said it's all, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. She said, and then we're here, and then when we die, we don't take anything with us. We're still spirit again. We live on. And you know, it's true. There's nothing else. We were here before, we're after. We just get to live in this body for a short time, and we're gone. We need to make the best of it now. What does the Lord want us to do in this body while we're here? You know, is, are our actions glorifying him or aren't they glorifying him? How do we glorify him? By following him, doing what he wants us to do. You know, and by putting yourself down, by sometimes just going with that peace in your heart, doing what you know you're supposed to do rather than what you want to do, you have no idea the blessings you're going to get. You really, really don't. So use your judgment, use your discernment, Use that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
when you're making your decisions, choosing your friends, your spouse. Don't get caught up by the glitz and the glamour. Don't get caught off by the pretty package. Go with where your peace is at because the Lord's got the right person. He's got the right car, vehicle, job, whatever it is for you. Don't give up, persevere, and all will be well with your soul. All right? Thank you. God bless.